Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew again, and this is going to be all about water, how life depends on the unique properties of water. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of water and specifically talk about it as a polar covalent molecule. I will describe the properties of water, and I'm going to hit upon uh, the concepts of adhesion and cohesion. I will talk about uh, temperature moderation density, and a little bit about solutions when it comes to water. Um, I'll introduce the pH scale, and then we will talk briefly about acids, bases, and buffers. All right, so here we go. All right, so thinking back to previous videos, you can see that water is a covalent molecule. So what does that mean? So that means that there are shared electrons between the hydrogens and the oxygens that make up water in order to achieve that octet for the oxygen and the two electrons in the valence shell for hydrogen. Now, the thing that's uh, a little different when we talk about this covalent molecule, and this happens with other covalent molecules, again, is that the sharing isn't exactly equal. And so what happens is that the oxygen much more strongly pulls on those electrons than the hydrogen can. And that should make sense if you think about the fact that there are eight protons in the nucleus of a uh, oxygen molecule, but only one proton in the nucleus of the hydrogen molecules. And so as a result, what happens here is that the oxygen becomes slightly more negative and the hydrogens become slightly positive. This creates a directionality to water where there is a slight negative end and a slight positive end. This is what we call polarity. So the reason that this is an important idea is that when you have a polar molecule, polarity is going to set it up so that this now has the ability to make weak intermolecular forces, and we talked about those as hydrogens, uh, or hydrogen bonds rather, uh, earlier on between this water molecule and other molecules. And frequently, it's with other water molecules. And this is going to end up creating a lot of the unique properties that we see in water. Okay, so the unique properties of water, we're going to talk about four different categories here. So let's start with how water molecules interact. So not shown in this diagram, but um, the idea that water molecules will interact with other molecules or other types of substances, and they will produce this type of adhesion. Adhesion is when the hydrogen bonding occurs between a water and some other surface. So if you think about the fact that water has the ability to climb up a, a wet paper towel, for example, that's usually through adhesion. The water molecule has the ability to interact with the other molecules in that paper towel and, and have that um, interaction. Cohesion is the fact that water molecules bind to other water molecules and form those chains. Um, and so we will see that as well in, in a variety of different circumstances. When it comes to temperature modulation, this is the idea of water as having a high specific heat. And so what that means is it takes a lot of energy um, to change the temperature of water. So you have to put in a lot of water to, to uh, sorry, you have to put a lot of energy in to ch change the temperature of water. And this is, uh, this is, makes water have a really good insulating quality. When it comes to density, in most instances, when you make something a solid, uh, when you go from liquid to solid form, what you end up seeing is that uh, the solid is going to be more dense. But with water, and that's what's seen in this diagram, uh, when it goes from a liquid to a solid form, uh, the solid forms a crystal, it creates and takes up more space, and ice floats. This is enormously important for a li uh, life. If you think about uh, the life that occurs in a lake or a pond or a river or that sort of thing, the fact that it can freeze on the top and have liquid water underneath is a, uh, a big impact on the ability for organisms to survive um, throughout the winter. Um, and we'll see this in a lot of other instances. But this, this, this is a very unique property for water, not seen in most substances when they go from liquid to solid and um, has a huge impact on life. And then uh, lastly, we're going to talk about the concept of an aqueous solution. And so when we think back to our ideas of ionic bonding from the previous unit, when you have a uh, water molecule and you put in a salt, something um, that has like a negatively charged particle and a positively charged particle, the water molecules have the ability to surround that particle and uh, disassociate the, say, sodium from the chloride. This allows you to take a, a crystal, an ionic crystal, and drop it in water and turn it into a solution. And so this makes water often referred to as the universal solvent. 
All right, so this um, leads us to another important concept of uh, the discussion of water, and that is the idea of acids and bases. So in pure water, what you have is you have an equal uh, ratio of hydrogens and what we call hydroxides or OH molecules. And so uh, this would be a pH 7, freshly distilled water. This is sort of pure water, nothing else in it. If I was to create a solution that is going to give off hydrogens in solution, I'm going to make that acidic and I'm going to move up in numbers on this scale. And so what I see is that milk is slightly acidic, egg yolks a little bit more acidic, as is uh, uh, pure rain, which tends to have a little bit of CO2 from the atmosphere, slightly acidic, coffee, beer, orange juice, vinegar, uh, carbonated beverages, lemon juice, uh, gastric juices, uh, battery acid. So you see that these are things as you move um, to lower numbers where I move up in the scale, I become more acidic. And what this means is that these are substances that are likely to give off hydrogens or will give off hydrogens into solution, and that's going to be our definition of an acid. If we move down, so we move down to seawater, baking soda, um, uh, we look down to milk of magnesia, which people take if they have an upset stomach, ammonia, bleach, um, lye, or sodium hydroxide, uh, we will see that those are things that are going to pull hydrogens out of solution or are bases. So those are the our basic definitions, or <laughs> sorry for the pun, those are our uh, simple definitions of acids and bases. Acids are going to give hydrogens off into solution, and bases are going to pull hydrogens out of solution. There Again, there are other definitions for acids and bases, but for, for biological concepts, that's going to be enough. Now, when you look at the scale, you might be thinking, well, why is it that the acids are on top and those are, they've got more hydrogens, but they're lower numbers? Um, that is because the pH scale is what is known as a negative log base scale, which means that as the numbers go down, okay, we're actually going to be adding more hydrogens. So if we look at the ratio of, of hydrogens to hydroxides as the hydrogen concentration goes up, we're actually lowering the number. It's a, called a negative log base scale. The other fact there is that if it's a log base scale, what we're going to see here is that every one number on this is actually a tenfold increase. So if I was to pick two substances on here, so for example, I pick something like coffee and vinegar, and I see that coffee is just, you know, just under five and vinegar is just under three, um, and I'll say that there's about a, a two um, pH scale difference in between these two. Well, it's not that there's um, two times as much hydrogen in vinegar than there is in coffee. There's actually a hundred times because as I go from five to four, I am going to have 10 times as much um, hydrogen. And as I go from four to three, I'm going to have another 10 times the amount of hydrogen. So if I go from five to three, that is 10 times 10 or a hundred times more hydrogen. Okay, so this is called a negative log base scale. Uh, we're not going to make you do any calculations of pH, like using the official formula, but we may ask you um, the amount of hydrogen concentration in here. So let's uh, let's do another example here, and let's um, let's pick out a couple of uh, substances on here. So for example, let's start and talk about um, milk versus orange juice. So how many how much more um, hydrogens or how many more hydrogens are going to be given off in solution or how much more acidic is orange juice than milk? Why don't you pause and think? All right, so you should have come up with a number that is uh, high sixes for um, for milk, and for orange juice, it's the high threes. Now, if you got really nitpicky and, and, and went at it, you might be able to find some exact pHs, but hopefully what you saw is that as I go from high sixes to high fives, I go 10 times. I go from high fives to high fours, I go to 100 times. Um, and from high uh, fours to high threes, I go another 10 times. So you should see that this is a thousand times more acidic. Orange juice is a thousand times more acidic than milk. Okay, so that's the example I was hoping you could come up with. And um, you, we could do lots and lots of examples of these. Um, hopefully that's a little helpful. 
All right, so lastly, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about acids, bases, and buffers. So you might be asking the question, why are we talking about acids and bases? This is biology, not chemistry. Well, the truth is, is that throughout our body, we're often gonna be doing chemical reactions, and those chemical reactions are gonna impact the ability of solutions to either add acids or, uh, or add hydrogens or take hydrogens out of solutions. So one of the common examples that we have is that when our cells produce carbon dioxide through cell respiration and they put that into our blood, that actually makes um, a slightly acidic solution known as carbonic acid. And so CO2 in solution makes carbonic acid. We talk about that when we talk about um, uh, climate change and how extra um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere leads to ocean acidification. That's another commonality. So we will see that solutions are going to be adding carbon dioxide or taking carbon dioxide out are going to have a shift in pH, maybe making something more acidic. And as those CO2s come out, maybe making them more basic. Well, in a biological system, you can't necessarily just have pHs change dramatically all of the time. And so what we find is that a lot of the solutions within our bodies are known as buffered solutions. And these are solutions that have the ability to resist pH change. And so a buffer by its very nature is something that um, is going to help stabilize or resist pH change up to a point. So when carbonic acid, for example, is formed within our bloodstream, we don't see a dramatic change in our blood. Our blood pretty much stays at um, around 7.4 all of the time. Now, what happens if you have lots and lots and lots of CO2 go into the bloodstream? Um, could there be a point where too much CO2 comes in and it overcomes the buffering capacity of that solution? The answer is, yeah, it is possible to do that. But, you know, through, uh, uh, through the various biochemical mechanisms that happen in normal conditions, our body is able to uh, resist that pH change and keep the pH of our bloodstream very stable. You might be asking, well, why is it important that we keep our pH stable uh, in our body? And that's going to come up in our next uh, talk when we get to the idea of, of enzymes and how uh, enzymes have optimal conditions. And one of those optimal conditions is the optimal pH. So uh, hopefully that was a helpful review of uh, water, acids, and bases. And so that gives you a little bit of context on these uh, fairly complicated terms, but gives you a little bit of context for some of the things that we have been discussing.